okay data right i know you might have gone gone through this line or this statement so many times maybe some experienced folks out there okay data is new oil so people like you know david buckingham big data expert he mentioned that data is a new oil so i why did he say that data is a new oil you know this oil right i mean we we get this oil from from the earth and usually the oil which we get is like a crude oil raw oil right we need to refine that so sometimes we have this oil in the offshore rigs in the middle of the ocean so usually they pull this crude oil and they try to do all the refining system data is the exact similar thing yes so you you know the value of the oil right when back in days like you know all the arab people so they they used to have all this oil rigs and everything and they are like i mean even now they are rich yeah but now <laughs> all the it companies all the ai startups now they are they are making tons of money because they play around with data because they have this new oil they have this data and with data they they, they can do anything the reason why is like they can do anything in terms of it in terms of predictions in terms of prescriptions we will see that in the comment sections but but here data is the new oil we need to but what we need to do is we need to find it of course we need to find the data right you have data in different systems data is like scattered everywhere we need to extract right uh you might have also heard etl tools right usually being as a data engineer you should be familiar with all the etl tools but not really needed now because everything is cloud and you need to refine it you need to distribute it again you need to so you need to store in different target systems you have source you have target you have transformations in between we will we will discuss and you need to monetize yeah so usually you know if you if you try to compare if someone says i mean usually this is like very good starting point for someone saying that data is a new oil okay so uh, if someone asks me right usually like in any interview or any any normal discussions like a common discussion if i'm having with my friends or anyone like if someone says like data if if say data then i'll classify data or i categorize data in two different categories one is data storage and the other one is data transformation yeah so at the end of the day you have only these two things you have data you need a place to store the data and let's say you have data in different formats right you have different extensions of data like you have csv data you have json data you have xml data and structured data so you already stored the data now you wanted to do some transformation so that you find some insights you you find some valuable information out of the data so that you can make some decision right so if someone asks me data how you can classify it i'll classify it into two things one is data store and the other one is data transformation and in data storage right we are here to learn azure we are here to learn data engineering concept a data engineer role right because azure they have recently rolled out all their role based certifications so azure data engineer it's a role based certificate so here you want to have a role of data engineer again this can also be applicable for uh, business analyst they can be applicable for data scientist and the database administrators so wh whoever is working uh, with data this is applicable so when it comes to storage we have few components a few services within azure and when it comes to transformation we have few let's see what they are so the first one is azure storage accounts you have azure data lake you have azure cosmos db you have azure sql wow very good i mean we do have more than these but why do we kept only these because as i said this course has been designed with reference to the latest edition or content or syllabus of azure data engineer associate certification so these storage services are more than enough for you to understand or to start your journey as a data engineer yes these these are more than enough i mean almost like 85 to 90% of the storage services are covered within these services in azure yeah of course you know in azure you can find like a new service every one every month i mean they are, they are experimenting they are investing so much that's the reason azure now limited their certificate validation to one year before it was two years now whatever the role based certificate you achieve that's only valid for one year i'm not sure if if you are already aware of this or not i think they've they've changed this this rule or they have added this new policy from end of june so whoever achieves the certificate after june or starting july the validity is for one year and within one year after 6 months you can also revalidate yourself and that will again you have to appear an exam and that will give you another year extension so after after one year you can again reappear the exam and it will give you another year extension but you don't really have to pay anything so the main reason why they have limited or created this new policies because 
every month or every few months they are, they are adding new services and they want you to be up to date and that's really a good policy because there are people who are making so many certifications in azure let's say like we have 20 into x like you know 17 into x Azure certificates but that's no more uh, a thing now because they have to revalidate every year and that's really impossible for a working profession to <laughs> revalidate all those certificates because he has to also work right so he can't really focus for every year he can't do all those certifications that's, this is really good so that we'll be up to date with what we are working with like i said these these are data storage components and uh, when it comes to data transformation we have few services which is data factory azure data factory very very important guys being as a data engineer you need to master this service trust me this is very important azure stream analytics this is used for real time uh, data analysis right so you might getting data from real time sensors and real time messaging systems where you need to do some analysis on top of that and generate some reports and azure data factory used for batch processes you have azure data bricks we will we'll, we'll go and discuss about what is azure data bricks again data bricks this is booming right the, the creators of spark in memory computation tool they have started up a company called databricks then they tied up with azure now almost in all the services you can find this databricks because azure is completely transforming its processing and computing system in the back end you don't really have to worry about like what's happening in the back end like map reduce in memory driver node name node spark cluster you don't really have to worry about that everything is in background back in the scene you don't have to worry everything is taken care of by azure but you need to understand the tool to use it and the other one is azure hd insight if you are aware of hadoop systems right back in days at least like few years ago there was this term called big data and if someone says big data everyone used to think oh hadoop system oh hdfs hadoop distributed file system okay mapreduce okay java scala yes that's what hadoop it's a open source technology right now almost all the cloud computing giants have adopted this architecture and now they have built a system on top of this aws has its own and uh, azure has its own so they have adopted this open source technology and they have built some application on top of it for instance azure data lake is built on top of azure sorry uh, hadoop system and on top of that they also have a separate service which is called azure hd insight hadoop insight where they provide all the different components because if you are aware of hadoop ecosystem you have hive you have big scripts where you can write for a uh, semi structured data you have hive like it's like a sql like query and and you have a zookeeper you, you have so many other components within that you have scoop so similarly you can find all the components here in azure hd and don't worry uh, with, with all the terms and terminologies which i'm using here few few of you might be hearing that for the first time and it's like what this guy is talking I'm like <laughs> i've never heard of this don't really worry I'm just showing off here a little bit <laughs> that I know all this, but we will get there and uh, we will go in detail about each and everything so that we'll prepare you. at the end of this class. At least you'll be very much familiar with what I'm talking, especially on Azure Data Lake and all the terms and all the terminology so that at least you get what is what. And then you have Azure Synapse Analytics. Guys, this is a game changer. Yes. So whatever the services which I've talked so far, right, the storage and the transformation, if you combine everything, you find everything in Azure Synapse Analytics. Previously, it was like Azure SQL data warehouse formerly called, and they've put a lot of investment in this and they've made a portal. They have made a studio where everything is integrated and everything lies in one place, right? You, you, you have Azure Synapse license or subscription, which you've already taken from Azure, right? Let's say in your company, you're already using this and you want to leverage data factory. You have data factory. You want to use Azure data bricks. You have Azure data bricks, stream analytics, power BI, data lake. Azure SQL database or data warehouse and Azure machine learning studio, Azure Databricks ML. So everything is embedded in this Azure Synapse Analytics. Guys, trust me, 50% of the questions for data engineer certification, which you guys will be doing. I mean, most of you guys, because few of you guys are just here to upskill yourself. That's really good. I mean, I believe in both, you know, having certifications is a really good thing because it will give you a lot of value to your resume or to your profile. But what I'm trying to say here is either you attend the certification or you don't, but 50% of the content for your certification comes from Azure Synapse Analytics. Trust me, the new edition, they have changed everything. They want you guys, or they want us to focus more on Azure Synapse. And again, in the organization, most of the all data, you know, uh, data engineering platforms, right? That the project data engineering projects, they have this Azure Synapse Analytics adapted because most of the work before they used to use Azure Data Factory, 
because data factory was also integrated with Azure ML machine learning so that they used to do all this machine learning activities like, you know, drag and drop all those activities. Again, you know, uh, if you're familiar with ETL tools, you don't really have to code anything. You have an interface, just drag and drop and you just integrate. You need to have that logic. Again, for the first timers, I understand it's difficult, but once you practice with the tool, it's easy. It's a cakewalk for you. But what I'm trying to say here, Azure Synapse Analytics, really important, very, very, you make like two or three stars there. Very important. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I've also, uh, I've seen that a uh, few of you have joined and while joining that, you know, you've mentioned that, you know, we don't know anything about cloud. You know, we don't know, like, uh, please, can you also add like cloud 101 session? So we just wanted to get started, but we don't know cloud. We have never worked it. We have heard about it, but we don't know. Is, is, is it like cloud, cloud, the cloud, which 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 helps us to rain? <laughs> that, that kind of level uh, we are at. So can you please help us? So for them, I've just added this one slide. So you don't really need to understand what is cloud. Like, you know, you've, you've used YouTube, you've used Facebook, you've used your Dropbox or Google Drive. So that's cloud, right? You don't have anything set up on your local machine or in your device, right? You just use internet to connect to that, right? That is cloud in a simple words. Yes, that is cloud. So we'll be using Azure cloud and we'll be developing some pipelines because usually in, in Azure data factory, we call them pipelines when you create a data engineering pipeline or data pipeline with all the transformations, expressions and everything, source, pipeline, activities and target. Just, just try to imagine and visualize what I'm trying to say here. Okay, so let's start with this cloud 101. So I've got this definition from Oxford Dictionary when I was actually uh, searching or surfing in internet, like what is cloud computing 101? So the practice of using a network using a network of remote servers hosted on the internet, right? This is what I was trying to say, using a Google Drive. It's somewhere in the remote servers, like in the Google data center. Used to store, manage, and process data rather than local servers, yeah. Back in days, we used to have, a, I mean, even now a few companies, like, you know, banking companies where they have some sort of restrictions like GDPR, especially in Europe, and also some sort of regulations and compliances where they don't want it to share their data in the cloud, especially, right? Very sensitive data. They still have their own data centers like their own servers, their own databases, right? But I think that will change as well. So that is called their local server. So instead of local server, if you use some remote servers hosted in internet to store, manage and process data, that's, that's, that's nothing but cloud computing. That's nothing but cloud storage, as simple as that. And later on, later on, you know, these marketing gigs, right? You know, we have so many marketing, marketing guys in LinkedIn. I mean, of course, for each and every company, you have this publicity and marketing guys. So they, they have a lot of creative skills and they come up with so many new terms and new names. I mean, they invent new names. So then they came up with like, you know, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, artificial intelligence as a service, machine learning as a service, data engineering platform as a service. So there is no end to that, but you don't really have to worry about that. At the end of the day, cloud is nothing but hosting something in the internet and you're not managing that in your local system, right? That's nothing but cloud. Just for now, you, you memorize this, that's it. I mean, if someone asks, you can just give a online answer. And the other thing which I like is like, you know, definitions, one-liners or two-liners definitions, because we have so many services here and uh, going deep into each and every service and try to remember, remembering everything is really difficult, but you have like one or two liners. Uh, it really helps you to, you know, Memorize if someone asks what is Azure Data Lake, what is what is Azure Data Factory. If there is like a one or two liners, memorizing that is easy. So I always try to keep one or two liners so that it will be very straightforward and strikes to my head if someone asks something. Yeah. Okay. Again, back to our slide because you know most of the content will be focusing on these things and within these things in today's session because as I said, like you know it's a huge. We'll try to squeeze it in 14 to 12 days, but in today's session, yeah, we'll talk about this guy. Azure storage accounts, Azure data lake. Oh, why two in one day? Uh, there is a reason behind that. If you know Azure storage accounts, if you know what is Azure storage account, especially Azure blob storage, right? Then you know what is Azure data lake. Oh, what is this? Yes, because they have started with Azure blob and they also had this Azure data lake gen one in Azure. Okay, because they, they have started initially with different versioning and different naming. Slowly, they started rolling out with different names. So what they have decided is let's try to combine both and name it as Azure data lake gen two. Okay, 
okay what is this it's confusing i know it's confusing i'll i'll let like explain it. don't worry but just just remember that these two are almost same because whatever the components whatever the features you see in azure storage accounts you see them in azure data lake there is only one checkbox which you need to enable in azure blob once you enable that checkbox that will become as azure data lake <laughs> very simple very straightforward okay so before moving there uh, let's try to understand a little bit about this problem statement like need a solution which can handle below four fees i think before they used to say three fees now they've added one more i think this this we you know people keep on adding based on their requirement and based on their presentation but i think i found this in, in the internet so mainly the three fees which i know is the volume the velocity and the variety let's keep veracity aside for now so you know volume right i mean based on this three fees back in days if someone has to define what is big data they used to they used to come up with these three V's definition. They used to say, oh, volume, velocity, variety. If someone asks what is big data, they used to say volume, velocity, variety. Why, what is it? So what they are trying to say here is volume, big data, name itself says it's a huge data. You know that nowadays, I really don't have that stats information because if you try to find it in Google, you'll get it. Every second, how much tons of data we are generating all over the world. Right now, in, in this zoom right i'm speaking something and this data is getting stored somewhere we are generating right at this moment some data that's unstructured data video files right and there are some log files which are getting generated in the back end which we don't have access but zoom admins might have access maybe some log information like you know my ip address your ip address and some metadata like my name your name some contextual information right as an example even with zoom if you consider so that's that's the volume like you know we are generating some data someone might have generating some data and especially in because i come from industrial automation domain right so most of the time i work with all this machinery sensor data right uh, with iot internet of things industrial internet of things of course so there we try to do some predictive analytics on top of real time data when i say real time data it's like near real time data because you know machines plc systems scada systems dc systems they generate data for every second. Few systems generate data every five seconds. Yeah, based on the cycle, based on the frequency, you have this huge data which is getting generated, right? And, and you need a robust system to store that huge volume data. Okay, storing is one thing that's called loading. Clear, we have stored, right? We have stored, archived, dumped, stored, archived, dumped. Now, what are you going to do with the data? Like I said, data is new oil, right? Now you need to refine it. Okay, so now I have a month's data, like a historical data. And after a month, I wanted to like, you know, okay, let me finish all my priority works. And at the end of the month, I'll sit and I'll write some nice queries where I can query that a month historical data and then try to do some analysis. Why? That's of no use. We need real time trends. We need to understand how the machine is behaving in real time. Maybe the machine is not really working fine and it's trying to tell us, see, my temperature is going high. I'm giving you that data. My temperature is really like, you know, oxalating. It's, it's beyond the threshold value. Let's say the temperature should be around like 100 centigrade. And now I'm getting temperature values around 120, 130. That's not normal. So after a month, if I try to do that by then, the machine would have been damaged and there will have been like a lot of downtime and so much of damage and a huge loss to the company. So we also need to query the data in real time. So here, you know, storage is one thing and storing the data in the form where we can query it, like, you know, query readily available data, query ready available. Boy, I don't know how to form a sentence, but yeah. So you need to have a data which you can query in real time, right? So here volume refers to that huge data, which is big data. As I said, I come from this industrial automation. I've taken it as an example. If you, if you are familiar with the banking domains, like banking and finance, you might have systems like, you know, uh, trading systems where you get like real time data, huge data, like, you know, the company's stock price might be going up, down based on different, different factors. And based on that, you know, the stock price will go. I mean, again, for stock price, there are so many factors which are directly and indirectly proportional. There is a lot of correlation there, right? Based on these factors, like based on this real time data, the price goes up and down. So you need a real time data and you also need to do some analysis add some top of uh, add some analytics analytics on top of that real time data so that you can derive an outcome here the outcome is the stock price for me the outcome is to predict the machine health right so for different different use cases you might have different different out uh, outcomes so here that's called volume and velocity like i said right the frequency 
th there might be scenarios where you don't need or where you don't get data in real time. You might have data in the form of batch. So usually in banking systems again, because you know before uh, working in industrial automation, I was working as a software engineer at a bank and as a data engineer, software engineer. <laughs> now the roles have changed, right? So back in days, uh, uh, SQL developer, now they themselves call as a data scientist. Yeah, no joke about it. Seriously. Yes. So back in days, I was a software engineer, but now I'm a data engineer, data scientist. I don't really know who I am now, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say here is velocity. So I was working in a bank and there every night we used to have this batch, which was running. So what usually that batch used to do is it used to pull data from different sources and it used to run overnight and load it into a different source, a different destination, huge data, like the whole day. It used to collect all the data from the source and it used to do some transformations in the backend and it used to uh, put it in the target. So this is not real time, right? This is like a batch load, the combination of real time and batch load. Nowadays we call it as Lambda architecture. We will get there, but just try to understand the velocity is nothing but the speed. You have real time, you have near real time, you have like, you know, uh, batch process systems. So our system should be robust enough to handle everything. Okay. So back in days, we had different, different systems for different, different process for real time. We used to use Kafka, Apache Kafka. Okay. For uh, batch systems, we used to use o OLAP, uh, which is like a historical data warehousing concepts. But now people are like, you know, why do I need to use two systems? Can you make everything available in one system? Yeah. That's what uh, Azure was striving for, for so many years. And now that is there Azure Synapse Analytics. That's what I was talking. We will get there. But again, Azure Data Lake can also handle that. So we have so many services which are kind of overlapping here within Azure, but they are also very much efficient when it comes to their specific role, the services role. We will, we will discuss about that as well, but that's nothing but velocity here. Again, variety. I think this is very straightforward. You have different kinds of data, like structured, semi-structured, unstructured. I think I have another slide for data classifications. Don't worry. So veracity, veracity is nothing but the accuracy of the data, how accurate my data is like, you know, whether it's really correct or do you have some, you know, uh, data, some data mismatches. That's a reason we had back in days, again, master data management, MDM tools, there were like specific tools for this, where they have only data in one place stored. And that's like master data. And if someone is getting data from master data, it means that is accurate data. Yes, all the accuracy, they used to maintain like hundred, usually we can't maintain hundred percent accuracy, but they used to maintain 90 to 95% of accuracy in the data and they used to store in MDM systems, right? Now, now someone says that I need all these four capabilities in one system. Is it possible? Yes. Of course it was possible back in days, Hadoop, HDFS, open source, Apache Hadoop. It was possible. Yes. But now. That was like on-premise system and it was open source and, you know, there was no proper support because community was built that. And usually, you know, once the system, like once the pipeline was developed, they tried to put it in production. They faced a lot, many issues because, you know, new scenarios came in and then they needed some support. Then, you know, cloud era came into picture. They adopted this open source Hadoop system and actually they had to create a joint cloud era and then they licensed this Hadoop. And then they named it as cloud era. And then they started supporting production environments. And again, cloud era was on premise. And again, everything moved to cloud. Now Azure is leading this market. Now Azure said, okay, guys, of course, AWS, we have Google cloud computing. We have, but guys, Microsoft is a software company, right? <laughs> and they're investing so much of money in this. So they have adapted this and they have built a robust system, right? Pay as you go. We will get there again. Again, very straightforward, right? So don't get confused. Volume, velocity, variety. You don't really have to remember whatever I said right now. Don't have to just try to understand because none of this are going to come in your question, in your exam. This is, we are just building up the story. We are getting there, but to get there, you need to understand some background, right? We're just building up. We are getting there. Just, just, just bear with me. Just tighten your seat belts, you know, grab your water bottle. I want your hundred percent dedication and attention. <laughs> Okay. Like I said, like in the previous slide variety, right? It's very important. So that's the reason I've put an additional slide for that, uh, saying data classification, structured data, structured is nothing but like, you know, most of you guys might have already worked with SQL server databases, SQL databases might be like Oracle, MySQL, or, uh, MariaDB, uh, boy, 
come on help me uh, microsoft sql server so there are, there are so many sql server databases out there in the market some are open source some are licensed and you know asha she comes from oracle so they have their own system that's called structured data structured data is nothing but you know you have data in the form of rows and columns so it's called tabular data and again csv right you know comma separated uh, values uh, some some kind of delimiter you have like you can have tab separated values comma separated semicolon separated values but you have a structure there you have some sort of schema you have some structure you have some relationship and of course but but guys maybe you might have not worked with sql databases or csv data but all of you might have worked with spreadsheets like excel right you know what is structured data. come on don't lie you know so that's called structured data and the other one is semi structured data so usually it's it's like no sql data right we have no sql databases like mongo db uh, in azure we have cosmos db in in aws we have dynamo db document db uh, gremlin graph db so this is like no sql database the name itself says it's it's not a sql no sql it's it's not a sql so a few examples for this is you have key value pairs you have json you know json key value so json is very important going forward if you really wanted to be a good data engineer if you really wanted to be a good cloud engineer if you really wanted to be a good data scientist and you wanted to do some you know uh, analysis on top of semi structured data i recommend you guys to go through this json just try to understand what is json what is the structure of json because especially uh, if you because we need to use python maybe not here right but down the line you need to understand guys i know that i've mentioned or we have mentioned that no prerequisites or no programming language is required but the reality is you need to know sql mandatory no doubt and you need to learn python yes trust me i'm not from it i've done my engineering in electrical and electronics i've never i've never seen a programming language in my studies <laughs> then i started working in it and slowly i had to adapt it so the only thing you guys can do is like just adapt there are so many tools so many platforms in the market where you can learn so especially when it comes to sql we try to give you a crash course that's not included here but we are still trying and planning to do that sorry my mobile it's vibrating <laughs> so let me put it aside okay so we try to give you a crash course on sql and also on python so here asha she's she's really really uh, experienced in sql and python so maybe we'll try to put it somewhere within this agenda if we get some free time because at least you need to know very high level uh, sql queries and very beginning level python beginning level python which is really needed for data engineering roles that's it guys because you know maybe you might escape it now maybe for exam you might not have any questions maybe you might clear the interview but at the end of the day if you want to call yourself as a good data engineer you need to have these two tools in your pocket two programming languages sql to query the data which is in structured format in the database and python to write your transformations to write your own logic right you need these two so when you try to play with python uh, you have the data especially the data in the python mostly you see that in json you have dictionaries you have lists and you have uh, tuples so mostly you have like key value pairs there that's the reason i'm saying like if you can focus a little bit on json it's really good but for now you don't worry about that i'm not scaring you you know i, I that was not my intention but the reality is you know down the line you need to know then you have xml data then you have aml data so this i'm not sure if you've heard of this thing called uh, terraform there is a company called hashicorp and usually they started a, a, a tool right so they use this aml language and this is mainly used for um, setting up all your azure services without connecting to your portal it's like your development environment if you want to create azure sql database you don't have to connect to the portal but usually in production environment no one gives you an access to azure portal so that you can go and do something no they'll give you an access to your ide tool and using the saml language you have to create it but being a data engineer you don't really have to worry about it but this usually comes under semi structured language and then you have unstructured language which is a media files office files text files log files all the data in your device in your mobile phones what you see is unstructured data i think it's very clear very straightforward structured semi structured unstructured if someone asks what is the classification if you are appearing for like you know those fundamental certifications in azure you might get one or two questions on this but it's it's very straightforward we are not trying to get fundamentals here we are trying to get at least intermediate level knowledge that's what we are trying to achieve here 
Okay, so what if I say that, you know, uh, structured data, you have SQL databases and only you can store structured data there. And you have no SQL databases, that's where you can only store your semi-structured data. And you have file systems, right? In your computer, you open your C drive, create folders, and bum, 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 bum. You store all your media files, like, you know, photos, office files, text files, log files, videos, everything. File system, right? That's where you store your unstructured. What if I say that you can store all these three kinds of data in one place? Yeah, that is what we are trying to do now, right? This was again part of big data, Hadoop. Now it's part of Azure Data Lake. Again, before going to Azure Data Lake, we need to understand what is Azure storage, right? Now let's get, so far, whatever we've discussed was not part of Azure. We have never mentioned anywhere that, oh, this is Azure structure. This is Azure, no. Now we are going to get into Azure. Yeah. Azure storage, like I said, Definitions, I like them. That's the reason I put it here. Azure storage is a Microsoft managed, of course, Azure is part of Microsoft. So they have put it here like Microsoft managed cloud service that provides storage that's highly available, secure, durable, scalable, and redundant. We will see each and every one of this in detail. Come on, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And here is the main thing. Within Azure, there are two types of storage accounts. One is standard, the other one is premium. Uh, once I go to the demo instance, once I go to my portal, I can show you what, what are they and why they are important and how they are different, how they are different, okay? And there are four types of storage, okay? So within Azure storage, you have four different types of storage and four levels of data redundancy, okay? And three tiers, 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 yeah, three tiers for storing files. So we're gonna, we're gonna deep dive into this, but how this is related to data lake, trust me, because as I said, like if you are confident or if you know about these things, then just enabling a checkbox makes you get into data lake. And once you finish data lake, I would say like 10 to 20% of your Azure data engineering certification syllabus is done. Okay, so within Azure storage, like I said, you have what is this? Four types of storages. That's what he mentioned, right? We will see what are these two Azure accounts. We will see that. But before that, there are four types of storage. Azure blobs, Azure fly files, queues, Azure tables. And this is Azure storage. Just a second, guys. Okay. So out of these four, this is our go-to guy. Forget about these three. I mean, these are important, but these are not important as part of your certification. And usually even in real time work, right? So you don't really encounter much working about these systems because these are meant for specific use cases, but they are very rare. And, and these are not that depth so that you need to understand. These are like very easy to learn and easy to understand. I also give you a high level explanation about each one of you, but this is our go-to guy, Azure blob. We need to, we need to do a post-mortem on this guy. And I say post-mortem, we need to do like in and out. You need to do a research on this. This is the main guy. If you know Azure Blob, you know Azure Data Lake. You know Azure Data Lake, the storage, the major storage content for Azure data engineering part is done. So, and, and also you have Azure SQL database, Azure Cosmos, and you have so on, so many, right? So Azure SQL, we have a class tomorrow and we have this as well. But let's try to understand what are these different Azure storage accounts. Okay, so we have file, we have queue, we have table. Where is blob? Maybe blob is waiting at the end. Oh, okay. The last and the latest, right? Azure file storage. So just try to visualize what I'm trying to say to you. This Azure file storage is nothing but just open your computer, go to C drive. You have, you see so many different folders there. That's called a file system, right? Within a local machine. That is exactly the same thing what it is, Azure file system or Azure file storage. It is actually a shared network storage service provides administrators to way to access. So you have this SMB protocol using this SMB protocol, you can integrate your local machine to Azure. So if I wanted to compare this, uh, you can, you can assume like Google drive, Dropbox, right? Where you create all this and you have uh, Citrix file systems. So you have so many cloud file systems, right? This is exactly similar to that Azure file system. You create different folders and you can give access to each and every folder. And also you can give access to each and every file to uh, corresponding individual. 
So this is exactly the same thing. You don't really have to like go in detail about this. You have C drives, you have drives and you have disk caches, but in a very high level, this is Azure file storage, Azure queue storage. I think Azure queue storage is already there in, 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 in the IT for so many years, you know, FIFO system, first in, first out messaging queue systems, right? So Azure queue storage is a service that allows users to store high volumes of messages. So this is mainly used to, you know, uh, build your uh, messaging system, right? Uh, we, we have, we have some services like, you know, IOT hubs, events and all in the, in the coming classes, we will try to discuss about that in detail, but mainly this is used for, uh, storing and also like, you know, processing those messaging systems and process them asynchronously. So again, uh, and consume them when needed. Okay. Again, you have a retention period here for how long you want to store this message on the system. You can put a retention period of seven days after seven days, this message disappears because we don't want to have storage costs. So when it comes to Azure, right, you have different kind of costs. You have storage costs and you have uh, processing costs. You have data transfer costs. So that they want to make money. So they have created different, different costs there. So you need to be very careful, especially in your trial versions, right? If you create some service, make sure that you delete it or else you will be simply wasting all your Azure credits because you need them to fully prepare for the, all the labs and just get all the experience before appearing to the exam and also going to any new job interviews in this specific role. Like I said, Azure queue system, this is used for messaging. And if I want to compare that with a real day-to-day -day use case, I could say like SMS, WhatsApp, right? All those messaging systems. So basically that work with, with the basis of this, this, this is the logic behind that. And Azure table storage, the, the name is quite confusing here. Don't get confused. If I say table, it might be a structured data. No, I don't know for whatever reason they have put uh, the table storage. Maybe this is kind of misleading because when someone says table, we assume that, oh, rows and columns structured and schema data. No, here Azure table storage is a scalable, but it's a no SQL. Yeah, it's a NoSQL service. Again, when I say NoSQL, the first thing which has to come to your mind is key value pairs. You have a key, you have a value. If you want to query something, use key, select key, star, blah, 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 then you get the value of that. Usually we don't do this, but what I'm trying to say is like, you know, with the key, you can retrieve the value. But usually NoSQL databases, you have data which is stored in key value and document DB and the document format. When I say document, it's a JSON document, right? Again, NoSQL, JSON, XML, key value semi-structured data. So Azure table storage service is mainly used to store these kind of data, right? And uh, again, if I wanted to compare it with uh, some systems like, you know, MongoDB, all these kind of systems, they kind of leverage this uh, logic in the backend, but usually this is a schema less. You don't have any schema and uh, all the rows you have like with the key value pairs, but you don't really have to worry more about this because we have a session coming on this, which is uh, Azure Cosmos DB, which is a NoSQL database where you have different APIs. For instance, you have MongoDB API, Kremlin API, you have SQL API, and you also have table API. That is where we discuss more about this guy. So you don't worry about this one. For now, you have to worry only about blob storage. This is just to give you an introduction. So Azure blob storage. Okay, we are running out of time. Boy, I need to speed up Azure blob storage. So Azure blob storage is a Microsoft Azure service. Just, just focus and concentrate on this because this is really important. And most of the questions in the exam, if at all, they come from Azure storage, they come from blob. If at all, they come from data lake, they come from this because the reason why I'm saying again and again about exam, because it's, it's not something like we're really preparing you guys for the exam. We are also preparing you guys for the real time you know, uh, work implementation there, but I also want you to keep in mind because that is something which we are trying to achieve here, right? So Azure blob. And again, this is very important also for uh, your work as well. If, if you're being as a data engineer, it is a Microsoft Azure service for storing binary large objects, blobs, and, uh, it's compressed of unstructured data, like text images and videos along with their metadata. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is clear, but guys, what if I say you? the data classification, which you have seen before, right? Structured, semi-structured, unstructured. What if I say you that all three kinds of data you can store in blob storage? What if I can say, say that to you, like, you know, yes, that's possible because here in the blob storage, all the data is stored in the form of binary large objects or blobs. So usually they are stored in the form of blobs. Again, uh, some context about that, right? So 
large object storage in cloud optimized for storing massive amounts. When I say massive, it's a big data. It's volume. That's what they're talking. They say unstructured, but this is used for all the three kinds of data because mainly they wanted to focus on unstructured because for structured and, and semi-structured, you Azure already has some systems. So they want us to use them, but why I don't want to use your other system. I don't want to pay money for you. I will leverage Azure blob storage to use all my three classified data. I want to save money to my organization. That's where I get a uh, performance credit so that I can improve my salary, right? Jokes apart. And then you have a text and a binary data. Uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about. You can also store text. And usually, you know, uh, this is a symbol for that. In, in Azure, you have so many icons and logos and symbols for each and every service. And mainly this is called like, you know, general purpose object storage. General purpose, when they say general purpose, usually general purpose is nothing but, you know, regularly we use blob storage that's what they are referring here and cost efficient yes and provides multiple tiers we will talk about this multiple tiers what does they mean this is very important i think when i was giving an exam i've got like two questions from this type tiers yeah okay so in azure service hierarchy right so if, if any one of you are completely new to azure so usually the hierarchy in the azure is nothing but so you have this azure cloud okay the cloud is somewhere there and within cloud you have a subscription Okay, so once you create an Azure, uh, the subscription will be added to your account. And uh, an, an Azure account can have multiple subscriptions. I'll show that in my account because I've got like two subscriptions so that you want, you get an understanding of what a subscription. So in Azure, you, you can have multiple subscriptions. Usually in this example, we have only one subscription, Azure subscription. Within subscription, while creating any service, you need to create a resource group. Okay, okay. See the hierarchy, cloud, subscription, within subscription, resource group, within resource group, now you have all the freedom to create whatever service you want. And if you wanted to delete a service, you can go to the service and delete the service. If you wanted to delete the entire resource group, you delete resource group and all the services within resource group are gone. Guys, I'm talking the real actual terminology here. When I say service, Azure storage is a service. Data lake is a service. Data factory is a service. All these are cloud services. Of course, they are tools, modules, items, components, but actually they are called services. So let's, let's talk the actual terminology here because I want you guys to get familiar with that. So within resource group, you can create as many as services you want. Here you have storage account. Within storage account, you have blob, file, queue. We discussed, right? This is nothing new to you now anymore. Yeah, you guys can teach me back again, but yeah. And you have Cosmos DB service, Azure SQL, web app. Okay, okay. Within, I have a subscription. Within that, I've created Azure resource group, like, you know, data bag training resource group one. I want to create like data bag research and development resource group because we are, we are trying to build some products, huh? Secret. So within that R and D resource group, I want to create some other services like, you know, nowadays, no one really talks about this virtual machines because everyone wants to use like a platform as a service or software as a service, but no one wants, uh, wants to use an infrastructure as a service. It's like no one wants to really deploy a virtual machine and, you know, install the software. No, we want to use your actual service. If you want to use like Microsoft Azure SQL database, no one is like creating a virtual machine in the cloud and deploying the actual SQL server database. No, they are leveraging the Azure services <laughs> because no one wants to go with all the hassle. But yeah, if you have your own software, you can create a virtual machine like Windows 2019 server or Linux server or Ubuntu server or CentOS, whatever the operating system you want, you can create a virtual machine with that operating system. And then you can install your own software in that. And you have over control, complete control about your software, your application, right? Maybe you, you are building your own software, right? No one knows that. So you can also do that. So again, this is resource group two. I can create resource group three, resource group four, resource group five. So you can have again, a subscription one, subscription two, subscription three. So just keep this in mind because this is really important because now I'm going to switch to my actual portal to show you how it actually looks, right? Let's get into the real instance. But when I'm creating something, uh, I'm going to say that, okay, this is a subscription, this is a resource group. So you shouldn't get confused with that because I've already explained it here. Right. So just visualize this, put it in your mind. It'll be easy for you. I know like, you know, few of you are already familiar with Azure, but this is for someone who is really new. Let me switch to my portal. Oh, come on. Want to keep your incantations? No, I don't want. Okay. Asha, can you please confirm that you're able to see my browser, my Azure? Yeah, we know. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So this is my Azure portal, right? And this is my default directory. 
and uh, so usually once you create your azure portal usually you see something like this so recent resources right these are the resources which we have created i was just doing some testing but usually you get something like this this is your home page this is your platform to play okay so once i click on this you have all the services here on the left side and you also have a search box so that if you know what you really wanted to create you can just search with a name and it will find you that service and you click on that you can get the service yeah what you really need is a browser right either edge microsoft edge or a google browser google 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 browser and then you need to go to this portal.azure.com i think asha will explain you i'm not really sure if we will have enough time to go through that today but we in the next class that uh, how to create your own azure account and if you are familiar with that please create your own azure account so that you know you can practice with it but usually this will be your home page right you have different different services don't get confused with all the services like i said every month azure will roll out a new service we don't have to learn about all the services because like i said azure is rolling out role based certifications as a data engineer like i said in the slide showed in the slide you need to focus only on those services period let's not deviate ourselves because there is so much to learn in the world let's 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 put some boundary here until we finish the certification until you get this confidence then then you explore on your own okay uh let's go to storage account so usually storage account is like you know very commonly used account that's the reason they put it here or you see storage accounts right i think this is something which you already know now by now or you can just just type here storage accounts okay so there is nothing within my storage account like i said subscriptions right if you see i have two subscriptions one is visual studio enterprise subscription and the other one is azure pass sponsorship subscription uh so within my account i have got two subscriptions like i said you can have n number of subscriptions and let me switch to the other subscription and and usually within this subscription i don't have any azure storage accounts which are created let me switch to the other subscription and you can also set the default subscription here right so that you don't really have to switch whenever you come here set a default subscription here and then every time you open any of the service it will be pointing to this subscription okay so if i click on this subscription yeah these are the services or storage accounts which have already created right and you can see them the list of storage accounts and the kind okay kind type resource group location subscription right i think a few of these are already you guys are getting familiar with like subscription i've already mentioned location we'll talk about that resource group you know within subscriptions you can create n number of resources yes if you see data iphon eng iphon group data engineering group there is one resource group data bag underscore lux there is another resource group which we've created so within this subscription you can create n number of resource groups okay uh let's try to create our storage account yeah what you need to do is just click on that create then you get this thing and here right you have different different tabs let's not worry about these things we will get into detail about them here you can also switch your subscription on which subscription you wanted to create this service like i said azure account and subscription i want to create on this subscription uh, if you already have a resource group created that will be listed down here or else you can also create your new resource resource group tongue twisting i need to play with this tongue twisting why i'm not able to pronounce this 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 name resource group yeah okay if you can create your new resource group or you can leverage the existing resource groups what we do is let let me leverage the existing one or else you can just create a new one ah no let me leverage the existing one. i don't want to create one. and then you can give a name so this name should be unique right so usually this name should be unique within all the azure systems because once you create a storage account uh end point url will be generated for you so when i say service it's again all the systems are interlinked you know microservices architecture you might have heard about that services within the services with all the docker kubernetes and all so usually that is a mechanism they use to build this entire azure services in the back end but usually after each and every resource you get a url and using that url you can use some service principle so that other system can connect to that system let's say if i wanted my azure data factory to connect to this i can use a url i can use uh azure ad uh, credentials to connect we will get there but what i'm trying to say is you get a unique url right that's the reason this name has to be unique if i give test the storage account name test is already this is like very common name people usually start with test someone might have already used it five it okay no i want to give a very good name storage account right data back 
and uh, storage 507. Uh, because I want to differentiate, that's the reason I put it like blob storage 507. Okay, so data bag blob storage 507. Don't worry about 507, this is just a random number. And region, you can select what region you want. So usually by default, it selects East US. And if you are in India, you can use some Asia specific regions. And uh, now I'm based in uh, Amsterdam. So I'll use West Europe, West Europe. Yeah, because this is the closest one. So usually the region, I mean, all the regions have very good latency, but if you choose a region which is close to your location, you will have a very good latency. When I say latency, the speed, right? Once you click on the surveys, the speed and also the data retrieval speed. So here you have two different types of accounts. You remember in the slide, we were talking about Azure storage and then I underlined two accounts, then four storage uh, data types, four Q file message, um, message and queue both us. Q file blob. What was the other one? Table, right? These were the four. And before that, I mentioned that there are two different types of storage accounts. One is standard. The other one is premium. So standard is nothing but the most general purpose V2 account. Usually in standard, you have all these different replications or redundancy. We will talk about this redundancy again, very important topic when it comes to exam and also interview as well. And this is like the standard. Okay. So what is the difference between standard and premium then? So usually premium is used for low latency premium. The name itself says, right. It's actually premium than standard. So usually if you have like uh, use cases where you wanted to use a very good IO performance, where you need a very good input output performance, like, you know, you wanted your data movement and you wanted all your networks to be like very fast, super fast. It's like a dedicated systems, right? In that scenario, you will use premium. Again, if you, if you, if you try to search in the, in the browser, the pricing between standard and premium, you have a huge variation there because standard it's the general purpose, the regular usage thing. And if you wanted to usually premium is for like, you know, those, those, uh, exceptional use cases, but you don't really have to worry about that. But just remember that we have two different things. One is standard. The other one is premium. Premium is mainly used for low latency where you have very high IO performance related use cases. And once I click on premium, so you get like different things, block pop blobs, file shares, page blobs, right. And you can select any one of this. Usually these are all like a family of uh, blobs when it comes to blobs and also files, but this is mainly meant for blobs and files. You don't have like queues and tables. See, so there is certain limitation with this premium. Like I said, exceptional use cases, they only use this. And also you don't have like, you know, redundancy. So you don't really have like a high availability and disaster recovery there. No. So that's the only difference, but usually you don't really find like any questions in that, but just for your understanding, because you have an option here. Okay. So you have standard, then you select the redundancy. We'll talk about redundancy. I have got a few slides on this for now. Just keep locally redundant storage LRS and then go to next. You have, oh boy, you have so many options here. Let's not worry about this for now. Just, just go next. Just, just go next, next, next. Guys, what I've done is I've given, uh, I've added a subscription, selected a resource group, and then given a name for my storage account, as I said, unique name, and I've selected standard and I've selected LRS. I have not selected by default. It was LRS, which was selected. So I haven't changed it. So the rest of the settings I've kept at as it is. So all the settings are by default. I've kept them as it is. I haven't changed any of them because we will, we will go through them like, you know, one by one. Right. So done. See how fast it was. I've created a storage blob, sorry, not blob, actually Azure storage account. So if you want to go to your storage, you can search your storage and then that storage will be displayed. That storage container storage account will be displayed or else you can click on this, go to resource. It'll automatically take you to this storage account. See storage account. This was a storage account, which you've created data bag blob storage 507. Wow. Successfully we have done our first storage account. Kudos. Then let me take my tool here. Okay. Then I think here, if you see data storage, this is something which should be familiar to you by now. Containers. Okay. So for blobs to, to add blobs, you need to create containers. It's like a folder structure, right? You need to create different, different containers. You create a container within that container. You store all your files. You store all your data. I think that's the part which I missed to explain, but you have containers when it comes to blobs. Okay. For that for now, just, just keep this guy. File shares, 
we've talked about it azure file system queues we've talked about it messaging system tables we've talked about it like no sql system right so if you wanted to use these kind of things just click on this and then create the stuff and then upload the file done but like i said we'll be focusing only on the containers because these are not that important with respect to the certification so i think this is something which we've discussed really good and you can also see them here on the bottom uh here on this one i needed uh, this one here you can see so there are different options here hierarchical namespace disabled access tier hot we will talk what is hot what is cold what is archive we will talk public access enabled soft delete okay we will talk we will talk about that and you can just 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 get some you know uh fam familiar oh boy just get used to this <laughs> just just get used to this 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 portal this this ui uh okay now what we can do is let's go into this containers okay so you don't have anything here right let's create a container let me put this guy here on the bottom create a container uh, let me create a data bag plp sto rg and again with the naming convention right because you know when you're really working with your um, or when you start working as a data engineer in in the real environment you need to follow your uh, company naming conventions right because they might tell you that okay if you're creating a service because to distinguish between different different services and also services created with different groups different teams different persons right they they'll, they will assign you to follow a different naming convention it's not like okay so i feel like creating data bag blob storage 105 no i mean <laughs> you need to follow proper naming convention because these names are really important uh, because you know usually being as a data engineer you also need to create some documents and blah 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 so you need to be very careful while creating or using the naming convention so usually this will be given in the this will be like usually put in the company policy so that you know you can get it from there and by default you have private no access to this and you also have other two types of accesses we will talk about that but for now i'll keep it as private and then i'll keep it as uh data bag blob storage as a name for the container and then i'll click on create done we have created our first container and then within this container what you can do is you can just click on this upload and you can upload all your data when i say all your data i meant to say that you are structured semi-structured unstructured click on this upload again once you click on this advanced you have different different options here again access tiers block size and block type right we, we will talk about this we will talk about this don't worry so for now just 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 ignore this advanced tab and and if there is a file already with the same name it will overwrite the file with a new version so what you need to do is you need to click on this okay so within this data bag training i have created three different files one is json one is csv one is unstructured i will select all this done I mean, this is like your Google Drive, right? I mean, you click on that up upload option and then you you add all your files. But there is there is a lot happening in the back end here. There is a lot happening in the back end. But yeah, so if you see here, we have copied all the three kinds of data. Structured, semi-structured and uh, unstructured. So let's say if we wanted to view the data, click on this specific one. And you can you, you see you have like more information about this data if you have any metadata with a key value if you have any indexing you can see that here right and uh, it's an overview when was it created when was it modified access here encryption we'll talk about encryption because you know uh, security plays a prominent role when it comes to setting up cloud systems so you have to be very careful and you need to at least have minimum knowledge even if you're not a security guy even if you're not like a cyber security expert but you need to have minimum knowledge and understanding about deploying uh, services in Azure. We will talk about that. We'll help you with that, no worries. And you have different version snapshots. But here the important thing is, okay, if the file size is greater than 2.1 MB. Usually you don't see any content here, right? And you can also generate SAS. What is SAS? We have a slide for it. Okay, I think this, this file has like more data. Let me open this JSON. Yeah, you see? So if you, usually if you have like very small files, you can just have a quick look at them here. It's just like a peek, quick peek, so that you can see, you know, what kind of data you have here. 
and if i copy the url right the url of this guy you have a url here if i copy the url and if i try to put it here somewhere resource not found the specified resource does not exist okay so it says that this resource cannot be accessible from this portal or from this browser with this url endpoint if you see at the url right data bag blob storage 507 this is a storage which you have created dot blah 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 blah, blah. and this is the container which you've created data bag blob storage and this is a file name this is what i was talking about endpoint url so what is missing here is access right that is what is missing here so click on this change access level by default it is private let's make it anonymous click on this okay now it is changed now let me try to refresh yeah now you see once i changed the access level from private to anonymous then you can have access this one but usually this is not recommended i'm just showing you but usually you don't really access this file with the endpoint url but i'm just trying to show you like you know the different features and uh, properties and options you've got here okay so what we have done is we have created this um, container and within container we have added this files i think uh, we are good at least we've got a very high level understanding about azure storage blobs right so far we have discussed only about blobs here is my uh, pdf let me go back to my pdf again asha can you please confirm again that you are able to see my ppt sorry not pdf yeah we know you can go ahead thank you okay so so far what we have done is data classified and that data has been added and uploaded to the azure storage blob storage because let's try to use the naming convention and the names and the terminologies which were defined by azure blob storage now blob storage plus data lake gen 1 is equal to azure data lake storage gen 2 so generation 1 and generation 2 so what is uh, data lake generation 1 so as i said you know azure they've been rolling out new services like every month right so back in days they used to have this azure data lake gen 1 like i said it was completely a replica or complete similar system of course the architecture of hadoop hdfs so you have this hadoop uh, storage layer then you have the query layer on top of it you have a spark hive hbase and then you can also drill down using some different custom query languages like you know pick scripts and also hive queries like i said hive here so usually you have this hadoop ecosystem right on premise like i mentioned you in the beginning right which was like a big big thing and it was a game changer and it did change a lot of games in the market but what they have done is they have lifted it from the on premise from the open source and they have shifted it to the cloud and then they call it as data lake gen 1 this is what they had before in azure same entire azure uh, hadoop ecosystem lifting and shifting from on prem to cloud was called as azure data lake gen 1 now they have integrated that with blob storage why do they had to integrate it with blob storage because blob storage has has uh, other features like access tiers right redundancy life cycle policies security there are so many additional other features we have for blob storage so now they wanted to use hadoop features and functionalities plus they wanted to use blob storage functionalities and then they wanted to create a new service and that's what they called as azure data lake storage and make sense but you don't really need to understand the history right what you need to understand is azure data lake storage now it's called generation 2 forget about generation 2 let's only call it as azure data lake okay let me make it more simple forget about this guy forget about this guy now let's try to create azure data lake let's try to create azure data lake and i'll i'll also explain you what is the difference between blob storage and azure data lake i'll i'll, I'll show you a uh, comparison between both both of them so that you get a clear understanding there is very slight difference between both of them and uh, that 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 is what makes the azure data lake uh, a tremendous and a great uh, storage component comparatively or when it compares to a uh, blob storage you have hierarchical namespace okay but before going to hierarchical namespace we need to first create azure data lake storage 
no i don't want ink annotations okay so here we are right so let me go back to this one home storage accounts right let me create another one now we are trying to create data lake guys again same this thing uh, now data bag so these these steps i think we've already done this now d ls data lake storage 507 yeah uh, i'll use the same location because of latency it doesn't really matter let's use east us it doesn't really matter standard put it as lrs for now put it as lrs okay everything is good ha huh. here is the setting which you need to use if you want to create a data lake can you see this one data lake storage gen 2 so what you need to do is you need to just enable this checkbox that's it the rest everything remains the same you can leverage all the features all the properties all the aspects everything from the blob storage or everything from the azure storage and on top of that you use azure data lake gen 1 by just enabling this and in the back in the background right in the back of the scenes there is a lot happening and there will be uh, like i said data lake gen 1 will be configured for your system and uh, the disk spaces and all that cluster will be enabled for you but we don't care we can't even see that what's happening in the background for us if our company let's say my boss comes to me and says that boy you need to create azure data lake uh, storage for a customer can you please create it with so and so names he gives me the naming convention then i come here i create this one and then i check this that's it so what i need to do is i need to just check this one yeah by just enabling this checkbox now you are creating azure data lake gen 2 so the rest everything remains the same you don't really have to change anything next 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 running final validation click on create we have successfully i mean of course it's, it's deploying right it's deploying you can see the process here if you click on this you can see all the process so far what we have done this is like a like a, the log all the log activities right you can see them here you can also see them in the activity manager i'll show that so it's it's getting uh, it's it's setting up the the entire cluster like i said in the back end for us so usually this is fast comparatively you see this is fast now let's go there okay so what's the difference what is the difference you see here this guy hierarchical namespace hierarchical hierarchical yeah. hierarchical namespace enabled and the name data lake storage and the rest everything is same like what we have seen before of course we have not gone through each one of this but we will go but if you see here you see you have four options within this and you have security you have overview everything is still the same okay what we will do now is we will go to containers again create a container uh data bag dls container let me create this one right go to container you see add directory and if i go back to storage accounts i'm trying to go back to the other one which we have created okay i need to change this to this one subscription the one which we have created before was a uh, data bag blob storage 507 correct and the one which we have created now is data bag data lake storage dls 507 okay it's a little bit confusing okay open containers within containers so i need to go inside the containers okay if you see here let me switch between these two. okay so here if you see if we try to switch between these two containers again both the containers are same one is data lake and one the other one is uh, blob storage if you see here here in this container you have upload and you don't have add directory here you have add directory that's the only difference that is the only difference you have between storage blob storage and uh, data yes and the other difference is manage acl access control list 
access control list you have for data lake and access control list you don't have for blob storage. The rest, everything is same. I'm again saying that add directory and access control list. Those are the two things which you get for data lake and the rest, everything is same between blob storage or Azure storage and data lake. So if I go here and click on add directory, let me add a file A as a directory. Okay, it's trying to create a folder structure for me in the back end. File uh, A, B, maybe create file A, B. Okay, so I've created two file structures here and within file A, B, I can also create another directory. Child A, B, for instance, right? And within this child, I want to upload my files, the same three files. Up, 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 up. Boom. Done. Yes. If I close this and again, so you have all the three files here. If I click on this, you see, you can see the same thing here, like, you know, edit and then almost you see all the, all the features are as it is and same. So why we have this differentiation is because uh, here, right, uh, the reason for hierarchical namespace, let me bring out my slide, the PPT. Okay, so here, like I said, uh, that's that's actually the Azure Data Lake. And here, if you see, uh, you can create a different uh, hierarchical namespace, a different folder structures, right? This is just by enabling this one. And this is mainly used to organize your objects or files into hierarchy. Like I said, if you're familiar with Hadoop systems, there you have different file system. So Hadoop system is nothing but Hadoop HDFS, Hadoop distributed file systems, right? So usually uh, they thought, okay, so in databases, you can store structured, in NoSQL, you can store uh, semi-structured, but let's use this file systems architecture, which was already there from ages, file systems architecture, Linux based concept. Let's try to utilize this and try to leverage that to store all the content, like variety of data, and then create different, different file structures so that we can leverage the access controls. Let's say I have created file AB, or else we can just take an example from here itself. Let's say you have level one, level two, level three, level four. Let's say you have like four different levels and within level one, let's say you have leaf one, leaf two, right? And if I wanted to give access to leaf one for a specific user or a service principle, when I say service principle, it can be a user, it can be a group, it can be another managed identity, right? I can give access to this so that the person or that app or that service will have only access to this folder and all the contents within this folder. So that it will be very easy for you to do this access control lists when it comes to hierarchical namespace, right? And you have this feature when it comes to data lake, but you cannot create these kind of folder structures in blob storage, no. You create container and you can fake it by using forward slashes, but you cannot create these kind of hierarchical namespace, right? So that's what uh, he's saying here. Use slashes in blob, but, but that stimulates, but that's like faking something, but you don't really have this folder structure here. But blob cannot integrate with Hadoop, but hierarchical namespace, like I said, like, you know, data lake integrates with Hadoop because that was built on Hadoop. This was exactly, this was completely built on Hadoop. So now you got a difference between now, you know, what is Azure storage? You have four different types. You have two types, premium standard, you have four different types. And within that blob storage is very important. And you know how to create blob storage, right? And uh, after creating blob storage or before creating blob storage or before creating Azure storage, just by enabling the checkbox, you know how to create a Azure data lake. And you know, in a very high level, the difference between blob or the difference between Azure storage and data lake. So, so far, you know, these concepts, that's really good. Okay, again, Azure Data Lake, right? So you can ingest the data from different, different systems. Like, like I said, like, you know, in the beginning slide, when we have that problem statement of variety, velocity, uh, volume, right? You wanted data coming from ad hoc systems. You wanted data coming from blob storage, like a different blob storage, stream data, like real-time data, relational database. Let's say you have data, which is relational, like structured data, CSV files, spreadsheets, just, just put them in the Azure Data Lake, web server logs, Azure HD Insight, Azure HD Insight, Hadoop, right? And you have a direct integration between data lake and Hadoop because this was built on Hadoop. On-premise as 
infrastructure as a series service Hadoop clusters. Again, same. This is like a Azure HD Insight is a native cloud service and on-premise infrastructure as a service Hadoop cluster is nothing but the Cloudera systems, which I explained to you the open source, but again, licensed Cloudera system, but both are same, but this is here. You don't have to manage about infrastructure here. You have to manage about your services, infrastructure and everything. And again, really large data sets. So in a single word, you can store everything in data lake. When I say store, you can also process. We will see how to process using data factory, using stream analytics, using Azure Synapse. Yeah, there is another slide. Again, this is something which I've already explained in the previous slide, but this is in a very high level. It shows that, you know, you integrate data from different, different systems and put it in Azure Data Lake. Yeah, I think I've got the slide somewhere from other PPT, but usually this, this gives you an idea about how you can integrate and insert or ingest all the different kinds of data to Azure Data Lake. Okay, so Azure Data Lake, put it in the middle, right? So if I wanted to study about any new concept, what I do is I try to put it in the middle, right? I try to make this star schema so that I can visualize and picture that image in my mind whenever I wanted to understand something. So we wanted to study about data lake. I put it in the middle, like a star schema. We wanted to know what our access tiers, important concept guys. You might get a one or two questions from this. We need to know the security, different types of securities you have. You have uh, access keys, you have uh, SAS, right? Uh, SAS tokens. And you have uh, Active Directory, role-based access controls, and you have access control lists, which I mentioned, right? ACL, where you can give folder level access, and you also have data encryption techniques. So everything comes into security. Then you have lifecycle policy. I'll tell what is lifecycle policy. And you have redundancy, the ones which I showed, like local redundant, zone redundant, geo redundant, that kind of concept. This is mainly used for high availability and disaster recovery. And then you have monitoring services. So monitoring services are quite common for all the services. When I say all the services, monitoring services, you have them for data lake, you have them for SQL servers, you have them for Cosmos TV, Azure Data Factory. No matter what service you're talking about in Azure, you have monitoring services for them because Azure have integrated Azure monitoring services to all of their services just to see how your system is working, right? You also have like a custo query language, especially in uh, log analytics, where you can query the performance events, everything from your system. So if you are familiar with Elasticsearch, right? Elasticsearch, that kind of systems, usually they kind of try to understand about your system's performance and everything. This is like a cloud-based Elasticsearch, like monitoring service. Right. So when it comes to data lake, we are going to go through each of these concepts, try to understand them in a very detailed manner and try to do like very high level exercises in each of them. And then we know what is data lake. done. Apart of these concepts, you don't have anything outside of this box. No, if you cover this, then you're good to go with data lake. If anyone asks anything about data lake, you have enough information and knowledge to share to them and clear the exam. And also like, you know, implement the real systems when you become a data engineer already, if you're a data engineer, but you wanted to do it in Azure, you can do it. Okay. Let's start with Azure, uh, data lake access tiers. Okay. Before moving to access tiers, uh, maybe let me finish access tiers and then uh, I'll halt for a second and then we'll discuss how to move forward. So when it comes to access tiers, right? So again, like I said, uh, data classification, you also have like a different tiers when it comes to data, you have hot data, you have cold data. Oh, what is hot? What is cold? Like I said, like, you know, marketing team, they've got like a lot of creative thoughts and ideas. They came up with such a cool names, hot, cool archive. I think archive makes sense because this is there in, in the market, in the, in IT for, for a very long period, especially for uh, backup and business continuity. And also for all the historical archiving purpose, we do this archiving, but hot and cold hot is nothing but the data, which is accessed frequently. I want a pen. Hot. Hot is nothing but the data which is accessed frequently. So what you mean by data which is accessed frequently? Let's say you have a data, uh, real-time data which you're getting today, and you wanted to do end of the day reports, right? Every day at the end of the day, you wanted to get all the data and you want to make the report. end of the day report for every day. 
So today you're going to make a report on today's data. Tomorrow you're going to make a report on tomorrow's data. So what you're going to do with the previous day's data, all the historical data, you don't need that. You don't really access that. So what you can do is you can send that data to cool. So cool tier is nothing but again, an optimized storing or storage mechanism, but here you access data infrequently, right? You access data infrequently. And here, once you send the data in cool tier, you have to store the data there for at least 30 days. Okay. So let's say that again, uh, end of the month reports, right? So at the month of, at the end of every month, I wanted to generate report. So after 30 days, you, you want to get the data and you wanted to make like a historical analysis and make like a monthly reports. And then you get the data from cool tier. And usually you store this here for 30 days and, uh, you access it. So usually this is like infrequently access. This is only accessed like once in a month, right? For monthly reports, you access it only once a month. Okay. We know what is hot. We know what is cool and what is archive. So usually archive is nothing but like, you know, all the years and years of data where you wanted to just archive and dump somewhere where you don't really access them, where you don't really use them, but they are really used for auditing purpose, right? Someone from a different organization, like, you know, big four companies like Deloitte or someone like a really big guy coming to your organization and asking like, are you really archiving all your data? Because there is some regulation compliance that you need to archive your data. So for that purposes, what you do is then you move the data from cool to archive or else you can directly move data from hot to archive. You can do anything, but usually archiving is nothing, but you archive the data, which is rarely accessed. Like, you know, once a year or once in two years or once in five years. Right. And here you need to store the data at least for 180 days. So what is it like store data at least 30 days, at least 180 days. So what does this mean? Let's say once you move data to cool, you need to store for at least 30 days. No, no, no. I wanted to delete that. Let's say there is another requirement came that, oh, we don't need that data and to be stored there for 30 days. Just, just delete that. Like after 15 days, you move the data to cool tier and you want it to delete after 15 days. Then Azure says that why I give you an option where you can store the data for at least 30 days, but now you are trying to delete it and, you know, save the cost, but I won't let you to do that. So it says that early deletion fee is there. If you're deleting before 30 days, there is some fee, which you need to pay. Again, if you go to the browser and try to search like, you know, the pricing uh, mechanism for different access tiers, you can get the fee. It's not that big, but you have this just, just keep in mind, especially because you know, being a data engineer, right? If someone says from your organization who has nothing, who has no knowledge in these kind of systems. And he asks like, you know, we wanted to build a system with hot, cool archive. And, uh, this is the cycle, right? This is the frequency of storage. Can you please recommend your thoughts, your ideas and all, then you need to come up with something like this, say that, you know, guys, you know, we can store 30 days and before 30 days, if you delete, you have some early deletion fee, just keep in that mind, you know, because we have our budget uh, this much and within that budget, we need to implement this solution. So we also need to, I mean, you guys need to keep all these kind of things in mind, especially when you're building a data pipeline and data, uh, transformation platform. Same goes for archive, right? If you delete within 180 days, you have early deletion fees in a very high level. This is hot, cool and archive. And once you create, you can send the data from hot to cool or while creating itself, you can say that put the data directly in cool. So you have that option. I'll show it in the portal where you have that. I think I've already shown it, but I'll show you again. Okay. So. Like I said, uh, I think let's try to understand the pricing thing, right? So let's not go deep into this. If you see here for hot storage, you have 0 0.018 for cool. You have 0 0.01 and for archive, you have way too less. So this is costly. This is medium and this is cheap. This is very low. Then someone came and said like, boy, this is so damn cheap. Like, you know, I'll, I'll suggest this thing to my company saying that all the data, irrespective of the frequency, like two days, yesterday's month old or year old, I'll put everything in archive. I'm, I'm saving so much money to my company or to my organization. So why can't I do that? Yeah, of course you can do that. I mean, there are pros and cons for everything, right? So here, if you see. Once you send a data to archive, right. To retrieve that data, it's not straightforward. You need to do a rehydration. So that process is called rehydration. So once you put a data in archive, so to read the data in archive storage, you must first change the tier to hot or cool, right? Either 
again, there is an option in the portal. Once you move the data to archive to move back to hot or cool, you have a process. And this process is called rehydration process. And this can take hours. <laughs> if your organization is okay with that, yes, you can go and do this. There are two different kinds of priorities here. There is a standard priority by default. This will be selected. So usually it will take up to 15 hours uh, to recover the data or to get you the data because based on the priority and based, based, based on the request, the, the request will be queued out there because this will be, this is like a common service, right? So many organizations might be requesting for this and that'll be like queued out and it might take up to 15 hours again, based, based on the queue list, it might again go beyond this time as well, because there is no guarantee on this, like, you know, Azure says that this is archiving process and this is not used for frequently accessed data. And there is one more thing, which is high priority. If you opt for this, again, you have to pay some additional fee and then you can get your data within one hour, right? But usually archive is used to store the data, which is not frequently accessed. So that's the reason you have different costs. So this is again, storage price, right? Storing data in hot, cool and archive. And there is another thing, which is data transfer price. Like I said, in, in Azure, everything is charged storing, transferring, requesting, uh, using any API, right? Everything is charged. Nothing is free there, but pay as you go. If you use, you have to pay. So when it comes to data transfer, right? Uh, you see when it comes to data transfer, hot is the cheapest one. Cool and archive, they are comparatively the cost is high because once the data is in these two, I mean, this is like a medium archived and this is completely archived, right? In these two different tiers. So once you want to request the data or you want to transfer the data from these tires to hot or some other tiers within these guys, you need to also make sure that you have a data transfer fee there. Just consider this, right? So you have storage cost, you have data transfer cost. So usually for frequency, that frequently accessed data, people use hot so that, you know, frequently it's accessed so that, you know, the data transfer costs are less, but if you're putting it in archive or pool and you are accessing it frequently. So every time you, you, you send an API request because everything again in the backend is an API request guys. Like I said, this is a microservice architecture. Everything is an API request. You use the portal, you, you click on that create button. There is an API request, which gets generated in the backend. You try to enable some service. You try to enable some option. There is an API request, which gets generated in the backend. So for data transfer, for data storage, everything is an API here. So every time you request some data, uh, you access, you have to pay <sighs> ah, very good money making business. Okay. Access to years. Yeah. I think this is what I had on access to years. I think by now you are like very much confident on what is access to years, discard, go back home storage account, create. I won't create, but I'll just show you. Access tires or oh, access tier is hot. By default, it's added there. Let me go to the ones which is already created. Where is this one? Data pack. Okay. For instance, if I go to containers, I don't know. Maybe my internet is not that speed today. It's taking time. Okay, for instance, for example, I have this file, right? And if I click on this, so by default, you see hot is inferred, and you can change it to cool or archive. Just, just select the cool and click on save. And this will be sent to this tier. And let's say if you wanted to put it to archive, see, there is already a warning saying that setting the access tier to archive will make your blob inaccessible. And 
to revert it back, it has to be rehydrated, which may take several hours. Like I said, this is cheap, but again, you know, retrieval, it might take time. And uh, if I go back to, I don't want to change anything, but usually that's where you can change it. And we don't do this because this is just to make you understand. I explained, but usually we change this setting using a life cycle policy, because let's say I have like hundreds and hundreds of objects and hundreds and hundreds of containers in my company and in my project. I mean, like, I don't want to do it manually one by one going there. Okay. One day he's done at the end of the day, <laughs> I'm being as a data engineer sitting there in front of the system and changing everything from hot to cool. End of the day, this is my job because I want to save money. So I'll sit there and I'll work hours and hours just to change this or else maybe some intelligent guy comes and this is like, let me write a script which will be automatically changing from hot to archive, like, you know, which saves automation, right? People wanted to do everything automatically and the automation projects are like boom. But Azure gives us uh, a module, makes our life easy, says that, you know, I already have something in place. You don't have to worry about that. So that's called lifecycle policy. We'll look at that so that you can add if else condition saying that, okay, after 30 days, move this to cool. After 180 days, move this to archive. After one year or 365 days, I delete this block. So you can add those if else conditions in the lifecycle policy so that you don't have to really do it manually. I'll show that where you can do that. Or else maybe I can just quickly go here and I can show it to you now. So usually you come here, right? This is a storage account and within storage account, uh, give me this guy. So lifecycle management. Under data management, you have an option called lifecycle management. You click on that. And you can add your rules. Here. So you can click on this. You can add your rule. For instance, rule A, right? And uh, you want to apply this rule to all your blob, blob, blobs in your storage account and uh, the rest everything keep as it is. And then click next. And here you can add your if else condition. Okay. Blob, base blobs word, last modifier. Let's say if I say the blobs which are not accessed from past 30 days or modified or accessed from past 30 days, then if not modified from past 30 days, then change to cool. Add one more 180 days, then move to archive, for instance. So you can create these kind of real time lifecycle policies and you can add as many as you want and click on add done. There is a rule already. So when it comes to the storage account, it goes to this container and within this container, you have different, different objects. And within that objects, it will try to, you know, there'll be a service in the backend, which will try to uh, look into those blob access levels and sees that, okay, if the certain object is not accessed for 30 days, okay. So this, this um, satisfies the rule, the rules, which were already created in the lifecycle management. And then it moves that data automatically to the different tier. So you don't really have to sit there at the end of the day and move everything manually one by one. You already have a process for that to do. Thanks to Azure. So I have a slide for that. Uh, let me put that slide. Okay, usually the second topic here is security, but uh, I've skipped this and I've showed you the AI life cycle because anyway, we were talking about access to years. But security is really important. We need to talk and discuss about that. And the third part is life cycle policy. This is what we've discussed now. Again, a little bit uh, theory about that. So it's it's like a management rule-based policy, which you can use to transition your data to the best access tier and to expire data at the end of its life cycle. Okay. So here uh, it will help you to transition blobs to cooler storage from hot to cool, hot to archive or cool to archive. And you can also delete, like I said, you can create uh, life cycles and you can delete and you can define up to 100 rules and uh, run rules automatically once a day. You can also do that. And again, this can apply to the containers or to specific subset of blocks or blobs. So you can leverage life cycle management. This is also important. I think you might get a question. Again, that's not really mandatory that you might get a question, but this topic is important.